Hi, welcome to this session, which is part of the 2017 Indie Author Fringe, where all the sessions in this Fringe event are focused on running an indie author business. Today, I'm going to walk you through the economics of audiobooks, which is all based on my experiences as an indie author, where I've had a thriller novel out on audio for just coming up to two years, and I have two more coming out this month. So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name's Ian Sutherland, and I'm an indie author. Previously, I had a career in IT, which has come through in my cybercrime thriller series, uh, which has a protagonist called Brody Taylor. My first novel was released in October 2014 and was called Invasion of Privacy. A year later, I released Invasion of Privacy in audiobook format, which means it's been out in audio for just coming up to two years. I've since written two other books in the series, the latest of which came out last October called Taking Up Serpents. But later this month, both of these other books will be also out in audiobook format. I'm proofing the narration at the moment, which is always great fun, as it's always great to hear your characters come to life in the voice of a uh, professional narrator. I'm also the author of Advanced Twitter Strategies for Authors, which came out in April 2015. And this is a guide on how you can massively grow your author interactions on Twitter, spreading the words about you and your book. And in February this year, I took all of the techniques that I teach in the Advanced Twitter Strategies book, and I wrap them up in a monthly subscription service where my team and I carry out all of the activities day after day on behalf of the authors who subscribe to the service. But today we're going to be focusing very much on audiobooks. In today's presentation, I plan on covering all of the main aspects of audiobook production, but much more focus on the why rather than the how. Ally has some great blog posts and recorded sessions on the how, and I'll reference some of these at the end. So first of all, I'm going to walk you through why indie authors should consider audiobooks as a part of their self-publishing strategy. Then we'll look into the costs involved in production and distribution, and obviously the royalties you can receive. I'll touch on marketing, and then I'll walk you through a return on investment case study of how Invasion of Privacy, the book I've had on audio for the last two years, has performed. So let's get on with the why. The most obvious benefit is that audio represents a completely new revenue stream for an existing intellectual property. This also has the benefit of being much quicker to create than the original content. Clearly, it's much quicker to record an audiobook than it is to write it in the first place. And the benefit of this overall is that you can balance out some low spots in one revenue channel with the other. So it may be that your audiobook sales are up when your ebook sales are down, and vice versa. But audiobooks give you access to a different readership than you might otherwise reach just through ebooks and paperbacks. There are plenty of people out there who only listen to audiobooks. Usually these are people who are doing something else while listening, you know, commuting to work, jogging, and so on. But there's also access to people with disabilities who are listening to audiobooks because they are blind or visually impaired. Having your book in multiple formats also increases discoverability. Someone might stumble across your audiobook and then might try it in paperback or ebook instead of buying it on audiobook, and vice versa. It just gives you more options to be bought. And uh, obviously, the more readers, readers you have, or listeners in this case, the, uh, the more chances you have for uh, increased word-of-mouth marketing. Another why is that there's also the benefit to be gained of fishing in a smaller pool, which gives you a greater chance of being seen. So essentially, you've got less competition. Audiobooks have much less competition than ebooks, and so you have a greater chance of being found or discovered in the first place. I actually went onto Amazon uh, as part of the research for this, and I did some comparisons. So if you look at uh, some of the different categories, so here we've got uh, one category of mystery, thriller, and suspense. And if you look on Amazon, there's actually 300,000 uh, ebooks available in that category. But on Audible, there's only 42,000 audiobooks, so one in six compared to Amazon. Uh, if you look at the romance category, your odds are even better. There's even more books, uh, 437,000 on Amazon, uh, but only 32,000 audiobooks. Uh, if you look at nonfiction, okay, nonfiction covers a lot of other subgenres, if you like, but uh, on Amazon, there's about 2.6 million books available uh, in ebook format. But on Audible, there are only just under 14,000. So clearly, having less competition can always be a good thing. Lastly, audiobooks can also increase your credibility as an author. As we've seen, with fewer authors creating audiobooks, it's kind of logical to think that those that do can be perceived as being a little bit more professional, whether they are or not, who knows, but it kind of helps you differentiate from, from those who haven't created an audiobook. 
And if you think about it, your Kindle sales page for your ebook can actually look a little bit more professional because of having the audio version available. Let me show you an example from my own book. Here's the sale page for my ebook version of Invasion of Privacy, the book I also have out on audio. And I've ringed four places on the page that just add a little bit of credibility to the ebook. So right underneath the book cover, you can play a sample right on the page. And the other areas, just go that little bit further just to improving the quality of the sales page and giving it that more professional look and perhaps converting more potential uh, browsers into readers or listeners. Um, some people even choose to buy both the ebook and the audiobook versions, flipping from one to the other via a feature called WhisperSync. And you can see that the option to add the audio at the time of your ebook purchase is right underneath the Buy Now button. So actually, having the uh, audiobook version can actually increase your revenue from the same reader. So we've covered why it's such a great idea to release audiobook versions of your books, but as we saw, not everyone does it. And the main reason is that audiobook production can be quite expensive, especially if you have to pay for narration. We'll come on to hiring narrators in a minute, but there are a couple of ways that you can lower the outlay by avoiding, by avoiding that cost. So if you have access to professional recording equipment, then you can narrate it yourself. Many non-fiction authors do this, as having the author as a narrator adds some credibility to the narration, especially for non-fiction guidebooks. However, fiction is another matter. Most professional narrators are actors, and this comes across in the way that they narrate all of the different characters with subtle changes in pitch and tone and accent. I know for a fact I'm not capable of doing a good job of narration, but some authors are. Another alternative to keep costs down is to share royalties. ACX, which is the company behind Audible.com and is owned by Amazon, provides the ability to set up contracts whereby you share your royalties 50-50 with your narrator in return for the narrator doing the narration for free. As you receive royalties, ACX take care, takes care of splitting it 50-50 between you both. ACX is currently the only system designed to support this, although I suspect other distributors will get into this in the future. This approach requires you to go exclusive with ACX, and we'll cover more on that later. You can obviously do a royalty share outside of ACX by setting up a private contract with a narrator and paying it out manually from your earnings. However, few people do take this approach just because of the overhead uh, and probably trust as well. All that said, it seems narrators are less interested in royalty share deals these days. The first thing a narrator is going to do uh, when you request a, a royalty share deal is to assess your ebook sales performance on Amazon and they'll look at rankings and so on just to work out whether it's a book that's already selling and therefore is likely, likely to sell well as an audiobook. If you're a best selling author on Amazon already, then you'll probably be fine attracting a royalty share narrator. When I personally sought out a narrator for Invasion of Privacy two years ago, uh, I initially did try and get a royalty share approach. However, I had absolutely zero interest from narrators at the time. My book wasn't selling well in those days. had a different cover, lots of reasons. Um, but the minute I switched to being willing to pay for the production, I was inundated with, with auditions. Narrators work to a rate per finished hour, uh, is the term. This means that you'll pay, you'll pay them for an hour of audio, no matter how long it takes them to actually record, edit, and master it. Typically, it takes narrator somewhere between six and eight hours for each per finished hour. So when you see these big numbers in terms of the uh, the budgets per hour, per finished hour, remember that there's a, a lot more going into it. You can get narrators for less than $200, but you really need to make sure they really are uh, truly professional and they're not cutting any corners in the uh, production process. Whether you're using ACX, which is what I did, uh, or even a full service uh, production company, make sure that you audition multiple narrators. For the audition scene that you select for the, you know, for the audition, make sure it has multiple characters and ideally both male and female speaking parts. And once you're down to one or two, check out their reviews. On Audible, listeners are not only asked to, re to review and score the audiobook, but they're also asked to review the narrator. So it's quite easy to find books by a narrator on there, and then you can check out their reviews to see what people are feeding back. For Invasion of Privacy, I had nine auditions. I wanted British English, as my book is set in London and is written very much in British English, with lots of slang and local accents. But I still had American narrators apply, some of which did a good job, but others just didn't really work. 
I discounted one narrator because his female character voices were far too high-pitched and almost falsetto, a bit cartoonish, really. Uh, I had one narrator where I thought he sounded pretty good, but there was just something nagging me. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And it was only when I looked at his reviews that I figured it out. His narration was far too monotone, and listeners became quite bored of his voice, according to their reviews. The narrator I, the narrator I chose is called Matthew Lloyd Davis. He's a Royal Shakespeare Company actor by night and a narrator by day. His English voice suited my main characters. Kind of wasn't too posh, and uh, he could do good regional accents, and he handled the female parts well, just with a small change in pitch. So when it comes to distribution options, there's quite a few uh, options available to you. I've listed the three main uh, options here. So the first is ACX, which is the company, as I said earlier, behind Audible and owned by Amazon. ACX will enable you to distribute to the three biggest audiobook sales companies, which are Audible, Amazon itself, and iTunes. The second distribution option I've, I've, I've categorized here is Authors Republic, which is kind of similar to ACX, but is open to all platforms. There are a lot more um, companies beyond the, the three big ones that they get you to. However, where ACX offers you the ability to find and work with narrators, Authors Republic expects you to manage this kind of aspect yourself. They do recommend some audiobook creation companies on their website. This last column lists two of the full service production and distribution companies that exist, and they'll work with you on creating and distributing the audiobook. They have an approved list of narrators and they'll match you with one of them. Uh, Listen Up is uh, in, in a partnership with Kobo, so they, if you're going to them via Kobo, you can get a discounted per finished hour rate. And Find Away Voices has a partnership with Drafter Digital, and if you go to them via Drafter Digital, you can eliminate the $49 admin fee. But as for distribution itself, there are some differences between them all. So on ACX, you have kind of two options. You can go exclusive, uh, which means you're stuck with ACX only for seven years. And obviously through ACX, you can, as, I see, as you say here, you can get to Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. Um, or you can go non-exclusive, which means that you can publish to those three platforms through ACX, but you could publish to other platforms via uh, other distribution companies. Uh, if you go exclusive, you'll get 40% royalties, and that's 40% of the price they sell it at. And if you go non-exclusive, you'll receive 25%. The other thing to be aware of with ACX is that it's only really available at the moment in four places, four countries. That's USA, UK, Canada, and Ireland. Um, there is one other thing, though. If you go through ACX, uh, if someone subscribes to Audible because of buying your book, uh, you'll get a $50 bounty, which I don't think you can get through any other means. Uh, I've had a few of those, and I'm always happy when I see one come through. Authors Republic... Uh, they're obviously, they can give you 25% of what you get on Audible, Amazon, or iTunes. So similar to the non-exclusive uh, relationship at uh, ACX. And then they'll give you 70% of what they receive from all of the other channels, which generally works out to about 35% of the sale price of the book. But the good thing about Authors Republic is it's available globally. So you can, uh, you can sign up to them from pretty much any country in the world. And then the full service distribution companies and Listen Up and Find Away Voices are just two of them. Um, they also generally work with all audiobook distributors, and both of these will give you 80% of what they receive from all the channels they work through. And again, they're available globally. Indie authors are kind of used to pricing their ebooks and paperbacks. However, if you're working with Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, which are the big three, as I've said, then you've got really no control because they set the price. Audible typically does it based on the length of the audiobook. If you are non-exclusive with ACX, then you can get to the other audiobook outlets via one of the other distributors. And those other audiobook outlets are more open to the author setting the price, which is known as the MSRP or the Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price. So for example, let's take my book, Invasion of Privacy. I, I had a check and uh, currently, bear in mind, I don't set the price. So on audible.com, it's $24.95 and audible.co.uk, it's £24.19. But that's the price to non-members, okay? Uh, on iTunes, uh, it's priced in the States at $21.95 and uh, in the UK at £12.95. Uh, but if you're on Audible, most people will buy audiobooks because they have a subscription, and a subscription gives you a credit per month, um, and the credit and the price of the subscription 
is $9.99 per month in the US and £7.99 in the UK, which means the price someone will be buying your book for if they use a credit is exactly that. So as you can see, you can't really control the pricing and then your royalties are based on the price that the, the, uh, the listener paid. There's a recent trend towards authors creating audio book box sets. Uh, it's really driven because of Audible's credit-based uh, pricing system. And this is because people are typically wanting to something 10 hours or more in order to get value for their credit. I think that's particularly true for uh, fiction books. So the, the idea here is if you have shorter books, you know, less than 10 hours, then you might want to consider this strategy of bundling them into an audiobook box set so that you can hit the sweet spot of being above 10 hours and then making your book uh, or your box set more attractive to, to people who are, who are buying through credits. As it happens, my books are, um, are quite long. Invasion of Privacy is a whopping 16 hours and Taking Up Serpents has come in at 12 hours. So uh, audio book box sets is not a strategy I'm personally pursuing. When it comes to marketing, I actually believe that there's not really much more that you should do above and beyond the efforts that you're already putting into marketing your existing ebook or paperbacks. Um, I, I think you should just let customers choose a format. So if you market the book, then they then, then they land on one of the sales pages, whether it's ebook or audiobook or whatever, and then they can choose how they want to consume or purchase the book. Uh, most of my own uh, Facebook and Amazon advertising campaigns, when they've been successful generally result in an uptick in audiobook sales on the side. So it does go to prove that. However, there are a few specific things that you can do. Um, if you're on ACX, in fact, I think even if you're not on ACX, but you can actually, you'll be given 25 free credits and you can use those with uh, maybe some of the people on your email list um, to get your book listened to and then get some of those early reviews that will help give it credibility in the uh, Audible and iTunes stores. Um, there are also plenty of audio file blogs and podcasts that you can um, uh, work with to try and get your book listened to and reviewed. And it is actually possible to uh, run specific Facebook ads which are directed specifically at audiobook listeners. So let's walk through how this has all worked out for me over the last couple of years with uh, Invasion of Privacy. As I mentioned earlier, the book is a whopping 16 hours. Um, I've put in the uh, minimum recommended rate here because the rate my narrator charges is his business. So two years ago, I actually didn't have the choices that are available today. So I went exclusive with, with ACX, which means I get the 40% royalty rate. Um, I've analyzed my income stream over the last two years, and it seems I average a royalty of $3.97 per audiobook. As I've said, they set the pricing. That means they also run discount promotions or whatever they want. I've got no control over it. Uh, if, and actually, if you look at my audiobook royalties, I've, there's a range between 80 cents. Clearly, they run some kind of discounted promotion for me to only get that. And right up to $5.24, which is probably someone buying it at the full rate. It depends on whether on how people buy it. You can, you know, through ACX, people can buy it a la carte, which is someone who who buys when they're not a member, and that includes buying it on iTunes. Uh, someone who's an Audible listener who's using a credit, and someone who's an Audible listener but they're over plan and they're using uh, cash, but they actually don't pay the full rate; they pay a discounted rate. So, anyway, if you do the maths at the, at the rate of three dollars ninety seven royalty per book, and the fact that I've spent uh, $3,200 on the uh, production, I actually needed to sell 806 books to break even. If I'd been non-exclusive, uh, then, and, and assuming all else is even, I would have actually averaged royalties of about £2.48, two, sorry, $2.48 per audiobook. Uh, and that means I would need to sell 1,290 copies to break even. I actually broke even about 18 months after publication. If I'd been non-exclusive, then at the same rate, it would have taken me just over another year from when I broke even. However, the important thing is that since breaking even, it's been all profit from then on. Well, that's assuming you're not spending tons on marketing, of course. The net result of all this is that I've decided to release both of the other books in the Brody Taylor series on audiobook format. I've used the same narrator and I've paid for him on a uh, per finished hour contract. 
and I'm currently proofing them and I expect to release them both later this month. Because they're part of the same series and, and because of the time it takes to break even, uh, I'm going to release continue with ACX and stay exclusive with them. But I might, I might make a different choice if I was writing a new series. But either way, my advice is if you're serious about audiobooks, play the long-term game. If you can record it yourself or get a royalty share agreement, then it's kind of a no-brainer. But if you have to pay for a narration, then it really will come down to cash flow. If you can afford the investment and your ebook sales are consistent, then it will pay out for you over the long term. And for me, as you saw, it's been about 18 months. So I've had a good experience with the audiobook version of Invasion of Privacy. So that's why I'm all in on the other two books. And in the future, I plan to minimize the delay between the initial ebook paperback publication date and the audiobook version coming out. After all, the sooner I turn on this revenue stream, the quicker I can break even and enjoy the benefits. I've actually listed some additional resources here. Ally has quite a few articles on the subject of audiobooks. The first one here is written by Kevin Tumlinson of Drafter Digital, uh, who announced his, uh, uh, their partnership with Findaway Voices a few months ago. Uh, the second one is by uh, Becky Parker Geist and was a video from the Ally Indie Author Fringe back in March this year. The third is a recent podcast from the Creative Pen where Joanna Penn interviewed J. Daniel Sawyer, and he's also the author of the book reference in the last link, which is Making Tracks, A Writer's Guide to Audiobooks, which he's recently updated for 2017. I hope you found this session useful. And if you'd like to learn more about me, then these are the links and my Twitter handles. And if you have any follow-up questions, then you're very welcome to email me at the address there. Thanks for listening, and I wish you all the best with your indie author business.